Wendy, welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for being here with us. It is a pleasure. You are definitely a very successful author, an amazing speaker, mm. but I would say that among all, you are a neuroscientist mm. and a yes. very well-known neuroscientist. <laughs> and uh, I would like you to explain to our audience how and when did you decide to become a neuroscientist, to yeah. devote your life to yeah. the study of the brain? Yeah, it happened on a very specific day. It was the very first day of my freshman year at UC Berkeley, and I had signed up for a freshman seminar class, which is a small class of 15 with a full professor talking about their specialty. And the topic that fascinated me was this class called The Brain and Its Potential. And it was taught by Professor Marion Diamond, who I didn't know, I just walked into her classroom. But that was an incredibly memorable day because she was so memorable. That first day and for the rest of my entire career, basically. She was standing at the front of the classroom. She was very tall, very athletic looking. She had this crisp white lab coat over a very beautiful skirt and blouse. Uh, but she had this hat box, this flowered hat box in front of her. And she said, um, she welcomed us all. She said how glad she, she was that we were in this classroom because it meant that we were interested in our own brains. And um, she, she reminded us that the brain is the most complex structure known to humankind. And as she regaled us with all the things the brain allows us to do, feel, see, laugh, crack a joke, um, she opened that hat box and with her gloved hands, she pulled out a real preserved human brain, which we did not expect to be in that hat box. But of course, it was the very first time that any one of us had seen a real human brain. And it is, it is awe-inspiring even today because I pull out a brain from my own hat box these days in front of my classrooms. What really made me want to become a neuroscientist was her story about um, the key experiments that she did in the 1960s, showing that the brain, the adult brain, could change in response to the environment. She tested this by putting rats either in a rat cage full of toys and lots of other rats to play with, kind of like a Disney world of rat cages, compi uh, compared to uh, just a small cage with maybe one other rat, no toys. And if the brain didn't change, then those brains in those two different environments should be identical. But the brains in that Disney world of rat cages actually got bigger. The cortical structure, the thickness got bigger, in particular areas in the visual areas, they had much more visual stimulation. In the motor areas, they were running around a lot more. In the somatosensory or touch areas, because they had a lot more to feel. And um, that was the very first uh, um, time that scientists had realized the adult brain could change in response to the environment in an anatomically demonstrable way. And I thought, that is so cool. My brain can do that because she told me that my brain could do that. I want to really understand how that works. And actually, Wendy, is one of the topics that you mention a lot in uh, your book, mm -hmm. um, Healthy Brain, ha Happy Life. Happy Life. Mm -hmm. But uh, when I was reading it, I also realized that it's a very personal book too. Yes. And uh, I want you to share with our audience yeah. what was the wake up call? What made you think, okay, it's something here that's not well. Yeah, yeah. So, um, there were a couple of things that happened when I had this kind of life-changing event. Uh, first, it was really at the height of my uh, career. I had started my lab and grants were coming in, papers were being published. But when I stuck my little head out of my little lab, I realized I had no friends outside of my lab. And I had great lab members and colleagues, but no real friends. And I had gained 25 pounds because I did nothing but work in my lab with these colleagues, not friends. I went on a river rafting trip um, to get away from New York and give myself a little, bit, a little bit of a break. I went by myself because I had no friends, but I went to Peru for a river rafting trip and I realized that I was the weakest one on this trip. I was in my mid thirties. I should, you know, I, I grew up in California outside playing tennis all the time, but I was the weakest person on this trip. And that's what made me come back to New York and go to the closest gym to my work and I joined and I said, I'm never gonna feel like the weakest person ever again. And I 
started going to classes, loved them. I felt an immediate kind of boost of energy when I like woke up my body and remembered that, you know, my body is used to moving and, and let's get back into this. And I found this class at the gym that I loved. It's a unusual class called Intensati. And it pairs physical movements from kickboxing, and dance and yoga and martial arts with positive spoken affirmations. And so you yell things like, I am strong now and I believe I will succeed. And it really made me feel just so energized. And so I started going very, very regularly, eventually, you know, over a year's time or so, because uh, uh, 25 pounds is a lot. It, I lost the 25 pounds. But then what really changed my life and my career was one day I was sitting in my office um, writing a grant, which is something we do all the time as scientists. And I had this thought that went through my brain <laughs> that had never gone through my head before, which was grant writing is going well today. I, I'd never had that thought before because grant writing is such a stressful, you know, kind of painful process. And, um, but it was going well and, and the writing was flowing. And I realized it was because my focus and attention was deeper and longer and my long-term memory, which is the topic I was studying in my lab at that time, was also better. And I realized the only change that I'd made in my life had been this 25 pound weight loss because I had started going to the gym regularly and, and eating you know, less bread and, and more balanced diet. And that's what made me realize that maybe exercise was having this, this really striking effect on the brain areas that I was studying in my own lab. And so I went to the literature and I realized that yes, there was a growing literature, but there was so much more to understand. And if I notice it from my own just observation of my own cognitive performance in every day, how can I maximize that? Maybe, maybe I could get even more. Maybe I might get my brain even better. I realized that it was so powerful with the potential to change so many lives, including my own, that this was something that I really, really wanted to study. And so that's, that's what changed my life. How was that process for you? Because yeah. that meant doing something that in this case was exercise right. that you have not done for many, many years. Yes. So it was like pushing you out yeah. of your yeah. zone of comfort. So right. tell me a little bit more how you dealt with yeah. that. My, my secret was that I, I had exercise in my life. I enjoyed exercise and going to this gym and going to the classes. And I love a good exercise instructor. And so, and I love good music. So I really rediscovered this enjoyment of, of just that community. Oh, by the way, I made lots of new friends in, in, at the gym. So that was, that solved that problem as well. But I truly enjoyed it. And, um, yeah, I, um, and I also enjoyed the, the challenge of going to harder and harder classes and trying different classes. And, you know, I went to this gym with lots of different classes. There was everything from kickboxing to samurai sword class to this intensity class, which was really new and nobody, I only went to that class that day because the other class uh, that I could have gone to was cardio boot camp, and that sounded <laughs> too hard. So I, I went to this other class, I didn't know what it was. It turned out to be harder because it's actually really hard to actually speak out and, and say these affirmations out loud while doing all these aerobic activities than it is to do a cardio boot camp where they don't make you say things out loud. That's part of the trick. It, it increases that cardiorespiratory um, load on you. And at the same time, it's a psychological tool because if you say these positive affirmations, it heightens that mood, that natural mood boost that you do get with exercise that I ended up studying in my own lab. So exercise is, is actually stimulating neurotransmitters that are improving your mood, neurotransmitters like serotonin, and dopamine, and noradrenaline, and endorphins and enkephalins. So it's, it's creating, I like to say, it's creating this kind of bubble bath for your brain when you're exercising because you get this infusion of these positive neurotransmitters. So I want to focus on that because uh, when you realize the impact that exercising was having on your mood, yeah. on, uh, on uh, your productivity, yeah. let's say, I mean, you decided to switch mm -hmm. 
-hmm. your, let's say, career focus and start doing this research on yeah. the relationship between the exercise and the brain. Yes. So, Wendy, what have you learned about that? I mean, how does exercise change yeah. our brain? Yeah morphologically yeah. and also in how it works. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I call exercise the most transformative thing that you can do for your brain today and the most transformative thing that you can do for your brain's longevity in the future. And that is for the following three reasons. Reason number one is, uh, this is what we've been talking about. There are immediate effects of physical activity on your brain function. The ones we've been talking, the one that we've been talking about is the immediate mood boost that you get. That's because you're literally stimulating these positive mood transmitters, uh, serotonin, dopamine, noradrenaline, and, and the endorphins. Um, but that's not all. You're also enhancing the function of your prefrontal cortex. So your ability to shift and focus your attention is demonstrably better, even after a single workout. And this is part of the work that I've shown in my own work, uh, research in the lab, a single 50-minute uh, workout. Um, that's, you know, a medium to high-level workout significantly improves your ability to shift and focus attention on a number of different tasks. So that means that if you are in a situation where you want to be in good, good mood and want good focus, um, um, you want to work out and, and have that workout in before you enter that situation. So that's reason number one, there are immediate benefits. But those benefits, it's not like my one workout is gonna change my brain for the rest of my life. It's a, it's a more acute effect, um, but uh, the real transformation happens when you do what I did, which is start to change your exercise regime so that you're actually improving your cardio rep respiratory fitness. I got so much more fit in that area and I'm, I continue to try and maintain my fitness and, and increase my fitness. So what's happening there is with long-term um, activity, you are literally changing the brain. And the most important way you change your brain is you are stimulating the birth of brand new brain cells in the structure that I had studied for 25 years before I switched my research, which is uh, the structure critical for memory called the hippocampus. So brand new brain cells are um, stimulated to be born when you're exercising. And those brand new brain cells work better than the cells in your hippocampus that have been there since you were born. Uh, they're more excitable. They get incorporated into memory circuits more readily than the cells that have been there. And they make your memory work better. So I think most everybody, if asked, would you like a better long-term memory? I will. <laughs> yes, the answer is yes. And so what? this is so critical. What I'm telling you is that physical, regular physical activity uh, can work to make your memory work better because it's stimulating new brain cells to be born there. That, there's only two brain areas in the adult brain where new brain cells can be born. One is the hippocampus that's stimulated by, by exercise, and the second is the olfactory bulb that's stimulated by lots of smells. So if you uh, enrich your olfactory environment, you get many more olfactory brain cells. But um, the hippocampus is what people are, are uh, um, very, very interested in. Why? Because it's important for our memory. You use our memory every single day. I want a, a really good memory. And number two, the hippocampus is probably the number one brain structure that is affected in both aging, dementia, and the most common dementia is Alzheimer's disease. So what you're doing with regular exercise that en enhances your memory function today as, as you know, active, active people before we reach you know, the golden years is we are building up the strength, the size, the number of synapses uh, and the memory capacity of the hippocampus so that um, uh, it takes longer for normal aging to, to uh, um, get at the hippocampus and start to um, cause memory deficits. And, and if you have dementia and Alzheimer's disease, for those plaques and tangles to attack the hippocampus, which they do, and attack it enough so that you start to see those early signs of dementia, which is, can't remember you know, what day it is that they were supposed to have this appointment or that appointment. How much exercise? Yeah do we need mm -hmm. does a person need yeah. in order to start seeing these benefits? Yeah, the most common question I get is, tell me the least amount of exercise that I need to um, get all these great effects. And so let me tell you uh, what we know right now. 
which is the recommendation is three times a week exercising 60% heart rate max or more for about 45 minutes to be able to get this. But that's, that is too general because you may be different than, than me. You may be more fit or less fit or have a different genetic background. And in fact, what we really wanna know is individually for me at my age, at my um, fitness level, at my gender, with my genetic background, what is the optimum exercise um, paradigm for my brain or exercise pre prescription for my brain? And that is the question that I'm trying to answer in the work that I'm doing in my lab. So uh, really trying to test many, many, many people, and not just on one kind of exercise, but a range of exercises. Because I can tell you, I hate treadmill. And so if you make me <laughs> do the treadmill, I will not be nearly as happy as if I can do an exercise that I enjoy. So the form of exercise does make a difference. Um, we are working with uh, dancers and dance studios because that is such a engaging and joyful kind of uh, exercise. So does that make a difference? There was an article in the New York Times saying, dance is the kale of exercise. I, I don't know if I agree with that, but um, maybe it is. We need to test that and nobody has done a systematic uh, comparison of different forms of aerobic or uh, uh, resistance training. And that's what we need to do. Wendy, what happens when I'm thinking now on, on the kids, actually, because there yeah. are plenty, there's plenty of works out there saying that uh, young people are not getting enough yes. air exercise. Yes. So I guess that not exercising has devastating effects for the brain, yes. right? Especially in young ages mm -hmm. where the brain is in development. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we as a species were made to move and the sitting down and playing video games and just sitting, you know, our sedentary behavior that is an epidemic, not only in the children, but in the adults as well, is not good either for our bodies or our brains. And so it's particularly critical in the children to get those habits, early habits started. Uh, and you know, we had we had the right formula early on in our educational system. It's called PE, physical education, every single day. It wasn't a big deal, it was just a normal part of the, the school day. And um, that has been taken out slowly because they need more time to study. Well, that is actually shooting, uh, shooting them in the foot because uh, without that exercise, uh, you are not allowing the brain to kind of reach its full potential. And so that absolutely needs to come back. I would like to discuss with you about all the potential effects mm -hmm. of uh, exercise. Yeah. And uh, one of them is how it helps us deal with the stress, something mm. that is very common in yes. society today. Yeah, absolutely. I think you've hit upon one of the most valuable effects of regular exercise. In fact, you, you interview people that are going to the gym and half of them, they don't know neuroscience from, from anything else, but they say, this is my coping mechanism. I can't cope with <clears throat> all the stresses and anxiety in my day without my regular gym. And they don't realize that what they're doing is they're changing levels of mood neurotransmitters and they're protecting their hippocampus from the devastating effects of higher levels of stress hormone cortisol. Two high levels of cortisol um, in your system that happens, for example, in extreme levels in PTSD will literally shrink the hippocampus. It'll start to kill the cells in the hippocampus. It'll start to uh, make the processes, the dendrites of the hippocampus kind of wither. Um, it's terrible for hippocampal anatomy and, and health. And exercise um, can protect the hippocampus from the devastating effects of, of too much cortisol. So what happens, because PTSD is kind of, a, let's say, an extreme example, yes. but what many people are are exposed to what is called toxic stress or, mm -hmm. or chronic stress yes, or sure. long-term mm -hmm. stress. Right. So what's the impact of that on, uh, on, uh, on our body? Because yeah. uh, obviously we have biological mechanisms in order mm -hmm. to cope with the stress, yeah. but if that's a situation that keeps going and going and going, right. 
sometime, I guess, I want you to explain this to yeah. us. Our body, our brain is not right. capable of dealing with this anymore. Yeah, right? yeah. And so chronic stress has devastating effects not only on the brain. Uh, one of the most devast uh, devastated brain areas, again, is the hippocampus. Why? Because there are many more receptors for cortisol, the stress hormone, in the hippocampus than in other areas of the brain. So the hippocampus becomes very, very sensitive, but is by no means the only brain area that is affected by, by stress. Um, uh, prefrontal cortex, critical for your ability to shift and focus attention, decision making, what's called higher level executive functions. Um, stress also uh, is devastating for the prefrontal cortex as well. So this high chronic levels of stress will start to affect your ability to make decisions, to focus your attention, working memory dependent on the prefrontal cortex as well, as well as starting to affect your hippocampus and your ability to remember things. This is why in very stressful situations situations, you, you can't remember the speech, the next line for the street speech because your hippocampus is starting to be affected in that way. But it moves down through your body. So all of the major organ systems are affected by stress. Um, cortisol has terrible effects on the digestive system. This is how ulcers can, can happen with, with chronic stress. Uh, the heart uh, with chronic stress and high levels of cortisol is um, uh, attacked and it can get weaker with, with that chronic stress. So, um, and, and also the vascular system is affected by chronic stress. So you have this kind of all out attack on your major brain and physiological systems with, with chronic stress and exercise can protect all of that, mainly because it helps kind of reverse those effects. It's not only building new brain cells in the hippocampus, mainly through uh, growth factors that I didn't mention yet, but one of the reasons why the hippocampus is benefited by exercise is that exercise stimulates the release of growth factors. Those growth factors are part of that bubble bath in your brain, and that's helping to protect the hippocampus, helping it grow, helping it uh, uh, thrive and survive. The same growth factors, maybe not exactly the same one, but growth factors are also helping uh, the prefrontal cortex increase its number of synapses and strengthen and increase in size, as we see in exercise studies. Uh, but exercise is also strengthening the heart, it's strengthening uh, um, the um, vascular system. Um, that's the other key, um, effect of exercise on the brain that people do not recognize. Regular aerobic exercise that changes, that improves your cardiorespiratory fitness, actually stimulates the growth of new blood vessels in your brain. And that is so critical because the brain is the number one user of oxygen in the body. So the more blood vessels that you have to bring that oxygenated blood to the whole brain, the better your brain works. So that is another reason why regular exercise will enhance the brain and also exercise can help uh, decrease the effects of stress on, on the brain. I know this is the topic of your upcoming book mm -hmm. in September. Mm -hmm. There is about anxiety. Anxiety. Yeah. And you talk about good and bad anxiety. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, I don't want you to give us spoilers <laughs> about your book, but uh, I would like you to give us like some tips or clues on how the how exercise impacts also yeah. dealing with anxiety. Yeah, sure. There are studies showing that regular aerobic exercise that increases your cardiorespiratory fitness can uh, help decrease the effects of anxiety, can decrease anxiety in you. And um, for the same reasons that it decreases depression, um, because these neurotransmitters like dopamine and serotonin are stimulated and it, it just makes, it changes, it shifts your mood. Um, I have to say that there's more known about the effects of exercise on depression and major depressive disorder. Uh, major clinical studies have been shown and the effects there is that exercise, regular aerobic exercise can be as effective as some of the most commonly used antidepressants to treat major depressive disorder, which is huge. And there's evidence that a similar kind of effect can be seen in anxiety. So it, it is a mood boosting uh, effect. Uh, it is a uh, energizing kind of um, uh, um, function that exercise serves. And uh, I think it's very important for people that are 
um, dealing with um, kind of chronic everyday anxiety, which basically everybody is dealing with. So, Wendy, in your book, mm -hmm. you mention all the things that uh, can also change how our brain works, boost our brain power, yeah. make our lives happier, yeah. besides exercise. Mm -hmm. It's what you call brain hacks. What do you mean by brain hack? What's yeah. a brain hack? A brain hack is a fast, easy way to um, address and improve your brain. So exercise, there's exercise brain hacks. Easy way to do it. You don't have to go run a triathlon. You can put on your favorite song in the kitchen and dance in the kitchen, for example. So that's, that's a great exercise brain hack. But there, every chapter in Healthy Brain, Happy Life has uh, brain hacks at the end uh, to allow you to implement the ideas that we talked about in the chapter in your everyday life. And all of them were designed to be four minutes or less. Or less. If we want to uh, uh, hack our, let's say, more cognitive brain, like more cognitive yeah. areas of the brain, mm -hmm. what did you recommend for that? Yeah. So um, one of my favorite cognitive brain hacks is one, it kind of does double duty. It's cognitive and it boosts reward or dopamine levels in the brain. And this is based on a study that was that came out a few years ago out of University of Oregon. And it's the finding that if you do something altruistic for somebody else, that actually boosts dopamine in your own brain. So I have a whole section on what easy altruistic thing can you do? Can you pay for the coffee from the for the woman behind you in in the Starbucks line? You know, it's only three dollars. Uh, easy thing to do. Uh, can you pay for the uh, uh, toll of the of the um, bridge that you're going over for the next car just as a surprise? Um, can you um, leave and a tip? for your uh, um, person that cleans your hotel room, you know, uh, um, um, things like that are very, very easy to do. And um, it does give you, uh, give you a wonderful sense of reward. And the more meaningful it is for you, the, the, the bigger reward that you get. And it, it gives you a wonderful way to start thinking about, well, what do I really believe in? Maybe I do want to donate. What, that, that's a big decision. How do I want to donate? How do I want to give this chunk of money? And um, it opens up all sorts of uh, research into what good are people doing in this world. It, it is about kind of creating those situations that make your life richer. And this also, bringing it back to science, corresponds to one of the major recommendations from a big NIH-sponsored study on how do you, um, how do you uh, uh, preserve your brain for longevity. Exercise was one recommendation. Good food, Mediterranean diet, you know, less red meat, more vegetables and fruits, a second one. The third one is cognitive engagement. Um, this means complicated things that you challenge yourself with, learning a new language, uh, uh, starting a new job, starting a new research program in your lab, for example, um, are all things that will definitely promote um, brain health and activity. And part of what I'm sure was contributing to those rats in the Disney world of rat cages is they had more cognitive enhancement because yes, they were running around, but there were more rats to play with and there were toys that were being changed out every single day. They were just joyously playing with lots of different activity, uh, lots of different um, elements in their cage. And, and that creativity uh, um, was, uh, can be reproduced in our own lives. You mentioned Wendy relationships mm -hmm. and uh, actually this human interaction yeah. is always uh, considered the number one ingredient for happiness. Yes. And uh, there is a very moving story actually in your book when uh, you describe how you decided to change your relationship with your father. Yes. Yes. Once your father was diagnosed with yeah. a neurological disease, yeah. that I want you to explain that. Yeah. And uh, how you made that relationship more emotional. Yeah. And then 
the impact of the emotions yeah. in all these processes. Yeah, yeah. I often describe my shift to exercise based solely on this observation. I gained 25 pounds and I went to the gym, and which is all true, and that was a major motivation. But what I um, what I can absolutely add is the fact that at the same time that I was noticing the positive effects of exercise on my brain, better uh, focus, better memory, better mood, um, that's when my dad was diagnosed with dementia. And everything that I saw enhanced in me, he had this huge decrease in these cognitive abilities. Very, very smart man, electrical engineer in Silicon Valley in its early days in the 70s. Always very, very smart, engaged, um, 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 always reading something. And one day he came home from his drive, afternoon drive to the 7-Eleven, which is only about seven blocks away, to get his afternoon cup of coffee. And he told my mom he, he had a hard time finding his way back home. The hippocampus is critical for spatial memory, just like that. And that's when I knew that there was something really wrong with his brain. And um, so I, w w um, I went and found him a, a great neurologist um, and he stabilized. He wasn't feeling very well at that time, but he, he got better, uh, but his memory never came back. He was still the same person. His personality was the same, but clearly he, he, he had a hard time remembering the things that we always remember. And I realized then that I wanted to change our, our personal relationship because as a third generation Japanese American, uh, we're, uh, we're always as a culture, you know, very polite, very friendly, but never very affectionate. So I never, you know, I never as an adult said, I love you to my parents, never, because that's too, you know, emotional. So we just never did that. And so, but with all of this happening, my both parents, you know, getting older, I realized that I, I really wanted to say that. And so they live in California and I, I live in New York. And um, I realized I couldn't just start saying it, uh, you know, out of nowhere on our weekly Sunday uh, telephone calls. Uh, so I decided that I wanted to um, ask permission, that that would be the appropriate thing to do. So I decided this one Sunday was gonna be the Sunday of the big ask. And um, I started to get really n nervous about, about it and kind of annoyed. It's like, I have to, as an adult, I have to ask my parents permission to say, you know, this is ridiculous. I don't really wanna do this. But the truth was I was just scared because I, I didn't know what they would say because uh, I'd never asked them this before. And I, I, if I was gonna ask, I really didn't want them to say no. <laughs> so, uh, so I knew that the only way to um, find out was to ask them. So this one Sunday, I kind of got myself ready and I called and the way these telephone calls work was uh, my mom would always answer the phone and I would tell her about my, my week and then, uh, and then she would go get my dad and I would tell him all the same stories about my week and then, then I'd say goodbye and I called him back the next week. So my mom answered the phone and um, you know, we shared about our weeks just like we usually do. And uh, somewhere in the middle of the call, I said, you know, Mom, do you, do you, did you ever notice that we never say I love you on these calls? And what do you think about, about saying that, you know, at, at the end of these calls? Silent. There, there was a, a very, very long silence because I'd never asked her or anything like that. And I, I wasn't surprised, but I found myself holding my breath because I didn't know what she was going to say. And after a very, very long pause, she said, I think that's a great idea. I thought, <laughs> thank God. And so I was trying to play it cool. And I said, that's great. That's great. So we finished, you know, finished our conversation. But then I kind of felt the mood get a little bit more tense, kind of like two lions circling each other. Because we both knew that the conversation had come to the end. We, we told each other everything. And that it's one thing to agree to say, I love you but it's another thing to actually say it out loud. So I said, I love you. And she said, I love you too. Like we were doing these cartoon kind of voices. And, uh, and I think we both said, oh my God, thank God that's over. Um, but we said it. And then, um, and then she went to go get my dad. And uh, I knew my mom was gonna be the harder one. And uh, so I, I had the same conversation with my dad. He said, yes. 
we said our awkward I love yous and, you know, hung up the phone. And, uh, and I burst out crying because I had never said I love you to my parents before. And it was, it was a very, it was a very moving moment for me because I felt like, and I know I did kind of shift my family culture that day. And, um, the next week I called back and, uh, my, I love you with my mom got, got, uh, ever so much less awkward, which was great. And then I got on the phone with my dad. So by this, he had dementia. He could not remember. And I was getting ready to say, um, to remind him that we had, we had agreed to do this. So, okay, let's, let's do it. Um, but he really surprised me because that Sunday and literally every Sunday, um, after that, he, he remembered to say, I love you first. And, um, and as a neuroscientist that studies memory, I, I know why. Uh, so emotional resonance is something that, that strengthens a memory, even one in somebody whose hippocampus does not work. And that's why we me remember the happiest and the saddest moments of our lives. And I think that my father, um, for my father, this was very memorable. His d adult daughter, you know, asked him if she could say, I love you. And maybe that, uh, that love or that pride that he had, that this actually happened, really created a new long-term memory in him. And um, so we, my father passed away last year. And so we will always have kind of the before I love you conversations and then the after I love you conversations, which have um, really affected my life for you know, the rest of my life. I mean, I think that was really brave. And reading the story was very moving. <laughs> Listening to you now tell the story was even more moving. Yeah. So how we can leverage this impact that emotions have mm. in order to make our brains work better? Yeah, well, there's always uh, uh, a multitude of opportunities uh, to be brave. And um, I think for me, it's about being ready to, to tell your truth. You know, in situations, difficult situations, you have to act on your truth. Maybe you're not being treated appropriately or fairly as a woman as a woman in science or a woman in business. You have to be brave enough to tell your truth and also be wise enough to do it in a strategic way that comes out to a positive end and doesn't just blow everything up. I mean, um, I think we are naturally emotional um, beings. And I think that that vulnerability um, is, is a key to, um, uh, to deepening relationships that we have, I think is a key to leadership because um, I've used those same principles in the leadership that I try and show in my lab and in my business endeavors. And it is about being honest, being vulnerable. It's not easy to do that. The final idea that I'd like to share is an idea that has undergirded a lot of our conversation, which is the idea of self-experimentation. My whole book is really the idea that I ended up doing an experiment on myself. I went to the gym because I wanted to lose weight, but I ended up doing an experiment that changed my brain and I noticed that. And um, I guess as you pointed out beautifully, the experiment that I'm trying to reproduce, I guess for my whole life is the enriched environment experiment. What is the life? and the experiences that I wanna have in my life that are going to enrich me and make both my body and brain as healthy and vibrant as I can so that I live the longest um, life uh, with high levels of cognition. And um, that is not only something that a neuroscientist can do, but that is something that anybody can do because your measure is how good do you feel? Does exercise make you feel good? Does that form of exercise, do you hate it? Okay, don't do that, but find a form that you do love. From walking, walking with a friend, walking to a destination, to whatever, uh, 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 
pole dancing or, you know, samurai sword class or whatever uh, creative thing that you can find that makes your body move and that, that you enjoy. Uh, do that with food. Do that with quiet time and meditation and contemplative. Do that with the the kind of relationships that you have and the level of vulnerability that you show in those relationships. It's all, of course, from a scientist, it's all an experiment that you can do, but it's an experiment that you can do with the goal of living a healthy life and a happy life. Wendy, thank you so much. Thank you.